Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the Kidney Cancer Association and Dr. Woods for inviting me to uh, be here today. It's my uh, pleasure to be here and give this uh, presentation and talk to you all after the uh, presentation as well. So my job today is to talk to you about the role of surgery in patients who already have metastatic disease, whether it's surgery to remove the kidney or to remove the metastatic areas uh, as well. Just to make sure I stay on time. Uh, so just to give a few definitions, uh, metastatic kidney cancer means that the kidney has spread outside of the, the tumor has spread outside of the kidney, and it's also known as stage four kidney cancer. And when we talk about cytoreductive nephrectomy, we mean removing the kidney in a patient who has metastatic disease. So this is called cytoreductive nephrectomy. And when we talk about metastasectomy, this means removal of a metastasis, which is removal of an area of tumor spread outside of the kidney in a patient who has this uh, issue, which is uh, stage four kidney cancer. So the first part of the talk will be cytoreductive nephrectomy, uh, again, removing the kidney itself in patients with stage four kidney cancer. These are the recommendations from the European Association. As you can see here for stage four, they simply recommend that in selected patients, we should do the surgery. As you could tell, this is not very helpful for individual patients. And uh, through the talk, I'll tell you what the nuances are when we try to select patients for this type of an operation. Uh, these are from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network uh, guidelines. And this is what they say. So if you have a primary tumor, meaning a kidney tumor that's removable by surgery, and a, an area of metastasis that's just one area that is, that is removable as well, then this patient should have both the cytoreductive nephrectomy and the metastasectomy. Now, they don't have to happen at the same time, but both should be uh, recommended. Now, if the patient has a kidney tumor that's removable by surgery, but they have multiple areas of, of spread, the recommendation in this situation is to do the actual surgery to remove the kidney itself, and then give uh, systemic therapy or medications either by mouth or by vein. And uh, my colleagues from medical oncology will discuss that in the second part of the, the session today. Now, if the patient has a tumor that cannot be removed by surgery, or if the patient is not fit enough to undergo an operation, then this patient should in general not have surgery and just receive medical therapy. And this is a more reasonable guideline compared to the uh, uh, European one at this point. So we do have data on cytoreductive nephrectomy in what we call the immunotherapy era. This is the era when uh, our colleagues used to use interferon therapy or interleukin therapy. They are used now, but to a, definitely to a much lesser extent. And on these types of curves, and you'll see a lot of them uh, today, the higher the curve is, which you see it up here, that means a better outcome in general. So here you could see that we're talking about survival, and if you do a nephrectomy, plus the medical therapy, the survival is better because the curve is higher than just giving medical therapy alone without kidney removal. This was a, uh, a randomized clinical trial, so this is the best level of evidence that we have, and this was uh, mostly based in the United States, but this was published about 15 years ago. In the same year, a similar study was done in Europe, uh, and this is led by our German colleagues, and again, the same concept that you see here. So the higher the curve, the better the outcome. And this is for the study group, which means the patients that had both the surgery and the medical therapy compared to the patients who had just the medical therapy alone. And again, this is a randomized uh, prospective trial. Now, when they, the authors combined the results of both studies, they found the same result, basically, that if you combine surgery plus therapy, you have a better outcome than just having the therapy alone without surgery. But again, you have to keep in mind that these patients that were entered into these clinical trials had to meet very strict selection criteria. So and this is not just any patient that had metastatic disease. These patients were very well selected based on very specific criteria. Now, this is a subsequent study, and this was retrospective, but they used the same selection criteria, but instead of using interferon therapy, they used interleukin-2 therapy, which uh, is felt to be more um, aggressive, but also uh, more curative. And as you can see here, this is interferon alone, the lowest curve, so this is the worst outcome. Surgery plus interferon is better, but when you combine surgery plus interleukin, it's the best compared to the uh, other therapies. 
Now, these drugs, as I mentioned earlier, are not given as frequently anymore. So now we live in what you know, people term the targeted therapy era. These are drugs that um, some of you may have heard of or might have even used. And we don't have any finished clinical trials to tell us what we should do. But we have two ongoing clinical trials. One of them is called Carmina, and it's based mostly in Europe. And what they're doing is that they're randomizing, meaning they take the patient and by random, uh, they, the patient either receives the surgery, nephrectomy, followed by a drug called sunitinib, or they receive just the drug itself without an operation. The primary objective is to compare the survival in both patient groups. And this trial is uh, slowly accruing, uh, and it's been accruing for quite some time now. Now, a different study, also mostly based in Europe, called the SIRTIME trial. As you can see here, both groups received the surgery. One group had surgery followed by the medication. The other group had the medication for some time, then surgery, and then went back on the medication afterwards. Again, this study is still accruing, so both of these studies, we don't have the results just yet. So in the meantime, what are we supposed to do as doctors? You know, we live in the targeted therapy era, but we don't have any hard evidence based on prospective or large randomized trial to tell us what we should do. So in the meantime, we're basing our uh, practice on mostly retrospective studies, and I'll show you some here. So these are in patients who had nephrectomy. We see that the response rates to therapies are, appear to be better than patients who did not have nephrectomy. Again, this is retrospective data. Again, going back to the same types of curves, we see that outcomes in general are better in patients who had surgery compared to those who did not have surgery. And you see that for both the progression-free survival and in overall survival as well. These are other studies that I'm just going to go through, different studies all showing the same thing, but keep in mind they're all retrospective, they're, meaning they're not actual clinical trials. Again, the red line is for patients who had surgery, their survival is better. Yet another study, if they've had surgery, the survival appears to be uh, better. However, we know that universally this doesn't apply. So not every single patient that had received surgery has experienced an improved in survival or an outcome. So how do we really select these patients? And how do we know who to recommend surgery for? So we know there are several factors that in general we look at when we see a patient in clinic. One thing we look at is tumor burden, meaning how much tumor does this patient have, both in the kidney and also outside of the kidney as well. And this makes sense. The more tumor we can remove with surgery, the better outcome the patient will have. And these are just different cut points that uh, has been, have been published. So if you remove more than 95% of the tumor, it makes sense that the patient will do better than if you remove just 5% or 10% of the tumor. Another factor we look at is the stage of the disease. Now, we're talking about patients with stage 4 kidney cancer, but this particular slide, I'm talking about the stage of the actual tumor itself, meaning how aggressive or how large the tumor is uh, in the kidney itself. And we know for tumors that are very aggressive, that are invading other organs, the outcomes in these patients are not very good if they have metastatic disease already. So in general, we try not to do surgery for this particular group of patients, which actually is, is rare. Now, histology meaning what is the type of kidney cancer. As you might know, kidney cancer is not just one disease, there's different types. Clear cell is the most common type, and the other types, we can lump them together in one group called non-clear cell histologies. And this you know, makes up about 20% or, or, or so of the patients. The data on this are, at this point, conflicting. There are some studies that say if you do cytoreductive nephrectomy in patients with non-clear cell, the outcomes are better, and there are some studies that say the outcomes are not different. So we are looking at our database currently uh, to revisit this topic to see if we can find out who benefits from this surgery if they have non-clear cell histology. There are also factors that are um, hospital-based. So this is from a very large database called the National Inpatient Sample that looked at more than 16,000 patients who had cytoreductive nephrectomy, and they found that outcomes um, are worse if the patients are older, and I'll, re I'll visit that in a second. The outcomes are worse if the patients are not healthy, which also makes sense. They're worse in smaller hospitals, meaning that the, the hospital that does not do this type of surgery very frequently. And uh, obviously the outcomes are worse and survival is worse if the patient has complications after surgery. 
Now going to age, these are two studies, one of them is from uh, our institution here, that found that in general, if patients are over 75 years of age and have cytoreductive nephrectomy, they are at a higher risk of complications and even a higher risk of mortality or dying after surgery. Again, we're talking a small percentage, of 5% in patients who are older than 75, but this number is larger than in those who are less than 75 years of age. So it's important to keep age in mind as well. Now, one study that uh, we did here several years ago to try to identify who might benefit from this type of operation. So we looked at our databases, and this is a retrospective, and try to compare survival in patients who had surgery and in patients who did not have surgery. And again, as we note here, that patients who had surgery did better. However, you have to think that if, if they did not have surgery here, that means that there's a very good reason why they did not have it. Either they had too much spread outside of the kidney, or the patients were too old or uh, too unhealthy to have an operation. And we found that there's these seven factors that can predict who might benefit from surgery. And when we look at these factors together, we found that if the patient has three or less risk factors, they do better than patients who have four or more risk factors here. And again, you see the same type of curve. If a patient has three or less of these risk factors, they do better than the other group of patients. And the other group of patients is either patients who did not have surgery, and you can see here that the survival is very similar to those patients who had surgery but had four or more of these risk factors. So in general, if the patient has four or more of these risk factors, we tend not to offer uh, surgery. But again, it's a little bit more complicated even than that. And um, a similar study was done by a different uh, collaborator, collaboration from multiple institutions in multiple countries, and they found similar uh, findings. Basically, if you have three or less risk factors, and these are slightly different risk factors than uh, the ones we found, uh, the survival is, uh, were, is better than if you have four or more of these uh, risk, risk factors. Um, when we talk about cytoreductive nephrectomy, it doesn't always have to be through a large open incision. In selected patients, we can offer a laparoscopic cytoreductive nephrectomy that could offer patients uh, less blood loss, a shorter stay in the hospital, and shorter recovery time, and even quicker start of therapy after the operation. So whenever we can do this operation laparoscopically, we tend to do it this way. But again, this has to be in well-selected patients. And uh, in a very small percentage of patients, we don't even have to remove the entire kidney, and we can remove only a portion of the kidney. But this is something that's done very rarely, but it can be done in very selected patients. Now, having told you, you know, that there are benefits for surgery, that surgery is important, there are some arguments against surgery that uh, we should all be aware of. Surgery does have some morbidity. It has some side effects that we always inform the patients about when we do the surgery or before we do the surgery. Uh, again, the only uh, benefit that we know of from large prospective studies comes in the area of the era of immunotherapy, especially with interferon. Sometimes patients can spend a long time recovering from an operation, and sometimes the patient can have disease progression after surgery, meaning that the tumor that's outside of the kidney that we did not remove can grow fast sometimes after surgery. Not necessarily because of the surgery itself, but that's how the tumor was meant to behave. And in the few weeks after surgery, we can't really start the patients on medications because we're afraid of complications from the medications, such as uh, wound healing issues and things like that. So we still have some work to do. We need to still better identify patients who might benefit from this type of operation. That's the operation to remove the kidney in stage four uh, uh, conditions. And we also have to find out the correct sequencing, whether we should give medications first and then do surgery, or whether we should do the surgery and then give medications to treat the cancer. And we're still trying to find ways to improve on the surgical techniques and use minimally invasive surgery whenever it's reasonable to do so to improve the quality of life of patients uh, after uh, an operation. So just uh, take home messages from the first portion of the talk. Uh, that we're still awaiting the ongoing trials, and these trials are being done with targeted therapies. We don't have the results just yet. I think surgery still is an important part of a multidisciplinary plan uh, in patients who have metastatic disease. And surgery is still recommended in patients who are young, 
and patients who have clear cell histology, who have good performance status, meaning they're behaving as normal as possible, they don't feel very tired, they're not very sick, they're not in bed all day because they're very tired. It's also important to do the surgery or to consider it in patients who have limited disease outside of the kidney and patients who have a limited number of uh, poor risk factors that I mentioned, you know, three or less uh, risk factors. And it's preferable to do it in high volume centers just because of the experience of the entire institution, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and other surgeons that could uh, assist with the operation uh, as well. However, just because a patient does not fall in one of these categories doesn't mean that they are automatically disqualified from having surgery. Again, we have to look at each patient individually and decide with the patient what we think is the best way uh, to proceed. So these are just more of recommendations and suggestions, but if the patient does not fall in this category, they can still be considered for surgery if, uh, if appropriate. Uh, this is uh, some work that we've done from our institution uh, for further reading if, uh, if you're interested. And uh, I'm going to move on quickly to the second part, and this will be shorter than the first one, and this is on metastasectomy. So the first part, we tackled removing the kidney itself in a patient with stage 4. Now we're talking about removing the actual spread, whether it's in the lung or the liver or other areas. And I'll go through this uh, briefly. So there are uh, some challenges in this setting. Uh, in patients who have metastatic kidney cancer, we know that most of the kidney cancers are not responsive to traditional chemotherapy. We know they're not very responsive to most radiation therapy. And the cytokine therapy, that's the interferon and the interleukin that I mentioned earlier, most patients do not respond. Only a small minority of patients respond to this. And with the targeted therapies that uh, are currently being used mostly, there are rare complete responses, meaning that it's rare to give this medication and see that all the tumor has disappeared. We see very good responses, meaning the tumors are shrinking, they're not growing as fast, but it's rare to see that all the tumors disappeared with these uh, types of medications. So there are other options in very well-selected patients, and you'll hear me say a lot, so not every patient who has spread outside of the kidney is a candidate for surgery to remove that spread. Sometimes there's multiple areas that cannot be removed by surgery. Sometimes technically it's not doable to do the surgery safely and cure uh, the cancer that way. But surgery is an option in a group of patients. And these are the guidelines. These are similar guidelines that I showed you earlier. This is from the European Association of Urology. And basically this is what they recommend, that no general recommendations can be made. If we had very specific recommendations, you probably don't need to listen to me this morning giving this talk. I'll be show just one slide and step down. But the reason we're doing this talk is because it's a, it's a dialogue and it's not set in stone what we should or should not do for our patients with metastatic disease. So let's talk a little bit about survival in patients who have metastatic uh, disease that have underwent metastasectomy. This is one of the earliest uh, studies uh, from our colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering, almost 300 patients, and these are, uh, this includes patients who had a complete metastasectomy, meaning they already had their kidney removed, they had metastasis, and these metastases were surgically removed. And in this very select group of patients, the five-year survival was about 44%, which is pretty good. But again, this is a small group of patients and not all the patients who present it to the hospital with metastatic disease. And it's important to keep that in mind. And what you'll see is the similar, a very similar number throughout the studies that I'm going to show you. This is another study, also five-year survival. If the patient has had any type of metastasectomy, about 49%. This is a much larger study. Again, the survival is about 44%, again, in those patients who had metastasectomy. This is the total number of patients. This is not the number of patients who had metastasectomy. And this is one of the most recent uh, studies from Mayo Clinic, almost 900 patients. Again, not all of them had surgery. Uh, less than 20% had metastasectomy. But in those patients who had complete metastasectomy, the five-year survival was about 45%, which is actually quite good. And this is the study that I just uh, referenced to you. Again, this is from uh, our colleagues from the Mayo Clinic. This was over a 30-year period. This is a retrospective study, and only 14% of these patients had complete metastasectomy, meaning they had complete surgical removal of any disease outside of the kidney. And they looked at the impact of surgery based on different factors. I'll just show you a few of them here. 
So in patients who had complete surgical resection, the survival was about five years compared to those patients who had no complete resection, and that's only about one year. So we see some separation of the curves. Again, the higher the curve, the better the survival is. And in patients who had only met spread into the lungs, if we can remove all that surgically, the survival is definitely better than if we cannot do so. And this was also true for a disease that's outside of the lungs. And you could see also improved survival in patients who had complete surgical removal versus not. Again, keep in mind this is also retrospective. And this makes sense. If we can remove all the spread outside of the kidney, the outcomes are better than if we can remove some of the spread, and the outcome is better than if none of the spread has been removed. But again, keep in mind that if a patient did not have this type of an operation, there must have been a good reason why they did not have it. Again, might, maybe they're old, maybe they're not very healthy, maybe they have too much spread outside of the kidney that it doesn't make sense to go after each area of spread. And this is uh, what we call a systematic review. So this uh, group of authors looked at multiple manuscripts from the literature and they put those all together in a big table and they studied what are the effects. So what they found is that you see here the black uh, box and in all of these studies there seemed to be a trend that metastasectomy can improve survival. Again, all these studies here are retrospective studies. None of them are true prospective uh, studies. There are specific metastatic sites that um, usually kidney cancer likes to go to. Uh, brain is one, although it's not very common. Uh, thyroid is very uncommon. Lung is the most common one. There's also liver, uh, pancreas. Uh, pancreas typically happens several years after initial diagnosis in majority of cases. Uh, that do have pancreatic spread, but also it's quite uncommon. So the majority of spread, we see it in the lung, uh, liver, and the lymph nodes. Uh, and then surgery or radiation can be done for these tumor areas. Uh, for example, for brain, surgery can be done if, um, uh, you know, if necessary. Uh, we can do radiation for the entire brain if there are multiple areas, or you can do what we call stereotactic radiotherapy uh, or gamma knife to attack one or two spots uh, in the brain. Uh, typically, if there's a spread into the thyroid gland, uh, surgically is done for this. Uh, for the lung, if there is a few spots on the lung that are removable by surgery, and that's the only area of spread, uh, that's something that can be done as well. Uh, for liver, in general, we try not to do metastasectomies just because, um, in general, liver spread is a poor prognostic factor, meaning that we don't know for sure that if we do the surgery that we're going to actually help the patient. So we don't really have that much data on removing spread from the liver in patients with metastatic disease uh, of the kidney itself. Uh, for pancreas, we can remove part of the pancreas. We can remove the entire pancreas depending on uh, where the tumor is. And this is typically done by our colleagues from general surgery. And uh, in general, the patients do relatively well after this type of surgery. Again partially because spread to the pancreas happens late after the initial diagnosis. Uh, we recently published our work on uh, doing surgery for areas of spreading into the adrenal glands, into the lymph nodes close to the kidney, or in the area where the uh, kidney used to be before. And we found that if that's the only area of spread, doing surgery can cure up to 40% of patients without any additional therapy. So again, it doesn't cure 100% of patients, but it cures almost half the patients if we select those patients very well. Uh, of course, kidney cancer can also go to the bone, and surgery on the bone can be done for different reasons, either because the bone has already broken, or because the bone is about to break, or because the patient is having a lot of pain. So either surgery and or radiation therapy can be done in those particular scenarios. We can also integrate surgery with systemic uh, therapy, uh, meaning either we can give immunotherapy beforehand, and this is a manuscript published by our colleagues from uh, medical oncology, uh, 38 patients who received immunotherapy and then had metastasectomy, and about 76% had complete resection of all their metastatic disease, and it took about two years before their disease started to progress, which is good, and the survival was about five years in this patient uh, group. Uh, this is another study that was published uh, with targeted therapy and not immune therapy. Again, a small study, and these patients received targeted therapy and then had uh, metastasectomy. 
and the survival uh, in this study we found that 21 patients out of the 22 were still alive at about two years after this type of an operation. All it shows is it's feasible, but this is not the standard of care. There are studies also that uh, either give the patients a placebo or a sugar pill after complete removal of metastatic disease or give them uh, a medication. You have here different types of medication. The one that the clinical trial that's active in the U.S. is this one using a drug pezopinib. So what happens is that a patient has had an nephrectomy, then they develop spread, for example, into the lung, then they have the lung spread removed by surgery, and now on CT scan, there's no evidence of cancer anywhere. So these patients, if they go into this trial, they either receive a sugar pill or they receive pezopinib to try to see if this drug helps. But just like Dr. Wood just mentioned, in patients without metastatic disease, that this type of study did not show any benefit. However, this has not been done in patients with metastatic disease, so it's worthwhile waiting to see what the um, outcomes will be. Uh, we definitely need to do more research to see how we time the surgery in patients who present with disease spread when they are diagnosed initially or if they have the cancer spread you know, a few years after the initial diagnosis. Uh, we can use these targeted therapies to test which patient might benefit from uh, metastasectomy. Uh, we are doing some research on the potential benefits or not of metastasectomy in patients who have non-clear cell histology. And uh, it's interesting to see how many patients might benefit from the surgery but are not being offered the surgery. And we don't really have that information. Uh, again, because most of these surgeries are done in specialized uh, centers. So take home messages for this portion of the talk on metastasectomy. We have to keep in mind from all the data I showed you that there is a selection bias, meaning the patients who had metastasectomy had it because probably they were younger, healthier, limited uh, disease spread outside of the kidney. And probably the patients who did not have the metastasectomy did not have it because they're maybe older, too much disease spread, uh, or they're not healthy. However, we still believe that metastasectomy is important in selected patients. Again, these are very similar criteria to the first part of the talk I showed you for cytoreductive nephrectomy. If they have good performance status, meaning if they're as healthy as possible, if they're good surgical candidates, if they have limited disease spread outside of the kidney, if it took a long time for the cancer to spread, that's a good indicator. That's better than when a patient presents with spread at the initial diagnosis. If we can remove the entire tumor, that's a good indicator. However, we still have to do metastasectomy sometimes for palliative purposes, meaning to improve our patient's symptoms, such as doing surgery on bone or uh, on brain, for example. However, we know we still need better tools to select our patients appropriately for this type of operation, and that's something that's being actively worked on here and in other centers as well. And we still need to study further the integration of these types of surgeries with systemic therapy to see what's the best sequence for our patients. And this is uh, another work from our uh, institution on the role of metastasectomy for further reading if you're interested. And thank you very much for your attention this morning.